Well, good morning, everyone, brothers, sisters, young people, boys and girls. Not many boys and girls, but I see one little boy there. Thanks for inviting us. We enjoy coming here. This morning I want to talk about what I believe is the major theme of the Bible. It's quoted more often in the Bible than any other theme. It's quoted more often than sin, more often than faith or grace. Love is the major theme of the Bible and the word love occurs 526 times. And it's not just a New Testament subject. It's spread in equal ratio in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are lots of references throughout the Bible explaining God's great love for those who fear him. God loves those who are his children and we need to respond to God's love to us as Jesus explained when asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So the love goes both ways. As Mark mentioned in his prayer, God loved us first and we need to respond with all our heart, our soul and our mind. But let's start with a little history lesson. About 170 years ago, the Christadelphian community originated in the US and in Britain. Christadelphians separated themselves from mainstream Christianity and rejected many false doctrines believed by churches. Some examples are these. The belief in the Trinity, not even mentioned in the Bible. The righteous go to heaven at death. The existence of a supernatural devil. And most of all, that angels have wings. As a community, we have protected our beliefs very energetically and have spent countless hours proving to ourselves and to the many who have joined us that we hold the truth of the Bible. As a faith, we decided to be separate from others and to hold to the truth of the Bible. I want to tell you a couple of stories about me growing up being separate or different. I grew up in a faithful Christadelphian home. I felt quite different from my friends at school and this is where angels and wings came up. When I was in grade five, I told the religious instruction teacher and the whole class that angels do not have wings and felt very holy in doing so. They either didn't care, didn't know, but they th certainly thought I was strange and different. And I thought that being separate was really important. On one occasion, at about the same time, I was staying with my grandparents, who were not Christadelphians. They were beautiful Christians, but I thought not as good as Christadelphians. Breakfast was bacon and eggs. I told them I didn't like bacon because I knew that Jews didn't eat bacon and assumed we were like Jews. I had no idea whether I liked bacon or not but wanted to keep separate. Sadly, over the years, we've had more than a few disagreements with each other over the perceived purity of our doctrines sometimes even hotly debating issues that are not made clear in the scripture. This goes on to this day and threatens to divert our attention from the main theme of the Bible, which is love. And it's a trap we can fall into so easily. Debate about doctrine and practice can so often bring out the very opposite of love. 
Now, to hold the truth of the Bible is extremely important. And if anyone goes away today suggesting that John Eakins does not value correct beliefs, they will have entirely missed the point. Recently at home, Maureen and I have been going through the Bible, looking up examples of love in the Old Testament. And here are some examples. I'd like you to turn the first one up. It's in Leviticus chapter 19. And we will be doing quite a lot of looking up today. Leviticus 19 at verse 18 says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. And in verse 34, The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native-born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Psalm 23. Surely the goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A very famous psalm. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. We then began reading some of Jesus' last words to his disciples in the week before his crucifixion. We thought that if we knew our lives would end in less than a week, as Jesus did, we would be anxious to give our children and grandchildren the best advice possible for their future way of life. With limited time, we would definitely focus on what is most important. We are sure that Jesus would do exactly that, and I believe he did. But never a word about angels and wings But for a moment, let's leave the main road and go down a little side lane. You'll probably remember in Luke 16, Jesus told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You see, some of the Jews believed that on death, you either went to heaven to be at Abraham's side, or if evil, to Hades where the fire was hot. Jesus himself told this parable based on their false doctrine. But you see, he was trying to teach them a different lesson. Now, we wouldn't do that, based on the fear of spreading false doctrine. But Jesus himself seemed unconcerned. Surely on that fateful night, he would have explained to them what happens at death and warned them to be aware of false doctrine. But not so. He focused principally on love and service to each other. So back to the main road. Come back to consider what Jesus thought was the most important lessons for the disciples to remember. If you'd come with me to John chapter 13, the record of the Last Supper, only a few hours before his arrest and crucifixion, We'll look up a lot of verses because the Bible can say it far better than I could. John chapter 13 at verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, 
He loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And in verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. What an amazing example of service and love to each other. Firstly, Jesus humbled himself by washing his disciples' probably smelly feet. Peter at first was so shocked he didn't want to accept Jesus' love until Jesus explained. And secondly, don't ever forget Jesus even washed the feet of Judas Iscariot knowing full well that he was going to betray him in just a few hours. My dear brother, my dear sister, would you humble yourself and love and serve someone in the ecclesia who you knew was going to betray you and try to harm you? Not next month, but tonight. What a powerful lesson for all of us about service and loving each other. And in verse 34, Jesus goes on, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In John chapter 14, next chapter, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands. And in verse 20. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus went on, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. And listen to this. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Isn't that beautiful? Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. And in John chapter 15 at verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
You are my friends if you do what I command. And in verse 17, simply, this is my command, love each other. And then facing arrest only a few hours away, Jesus prayed for all those who would believe on him down through the ages. He prayed for us in the South Adelaide Ecclesia today in 2021. Amazing. John chapter 17 at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me in the South Adelaide Ecclesia today to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So to sum up so far, I think we've proved adequately that love figures prominently in the Old Testament and Jesus said lots about loving in the Gospels. The question is, does the theme of love figure much in the rest of the New Testament? Well, it certainly does. From Romans to Revelation, we have 160 times where the word love comes up. Love surely is the principal theme throughout the whole Bible. John who Jesus loved wrote some beautiful words if you have a look at the first of John chapter 4 and there's a little mathematical exercise here as I read count how many times the word love loved or loves comes up in these few verses and there's a prize for the right answer. You might have to use your fingers and then take your shoes off and count on your toes. There's a lot. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. And don't forget the message while you're counting. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our, friend, for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the saviour of the world. 
If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given his, us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So how did you go? How many? Yep. Yeah. Mike, see more in afterwards for the prize. <laughs> Sorry about that. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, we read simply, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The concept of being loved or of loving someone is very simple and easy to understand. It's the main theme of the Bible. Dear brothers, sisters, young people and boys and girls, is it possible that we can read about God's love for us and our need to love each other and not take it in because it is so simple? Can it be a case of that awful saying, familiarity breeds contempt? I hope not. The reading we had this morning, written by Paul the Apostle, so we've had John the Apostle, Paul the Apostle. Sometimes Paul's writings can seem legalistic with complicated arguments to prove his point. However, this famous chapter is the gold standard as to how we should love, care for and respect each other. Let's now just consider some of the last words of Jesus at breakfast on the beach after the resurrection, once again about loving. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? And again to Simon's hurt, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus asked Simon, and he asks us this morning, do you love me? Simon replied with an enthusiastic yes, and Jesus said, feed my lambs and my sheep. This morning as we come to remember our Lord in the bread and the wine, he asks us, as he asks Simon, do you love me? And when we say, yes, Lord, let's make sure we mean it and put it into practice with him and with each other every day that we have left.